Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we will discuss the importance of increased diversity in the tech world with special guest Terry Hogan, President and CTO of the National Center for Women and Information Technology. So, Terry, thank you so much for joining us. I am so excited to be talking about this particular topic. You know, technology is such a massive, massive industry throughout the world and in the United States, in the Silicon Valley region, but also in technology centers from India to China to uh, Europe, all over the place. This, this, uh, this industry is burgeoning. And it is also true that while 47% of all jobs in the United States are held by women, we're talking about a 34.4% uh, proportion of jobs held by women in the big five tech companies. And it, it, really, it really doesn't look as good as it should, does it? It doesn't. Thank you, Mark. I'm so pleased to be here. And your statistics are correct. And they're even worse when you think about what work those women are doing within those tech companies. We know that the numbers of women who are actually contributing to the creation of technology through software engineering, architecture roles are in the low 20%. And if you look at the top uh, 500 companies in the US, only 5% of the CTOs are women. So it's pretty dismal. So what you're saying is that the actual deciders in these organizations, the people with the hiring authority, the people who are deciding the direction of tech, it's they're men, right? So let's talk about this in a number of different ways. There's a justice piece, but let's set that aside for, for a second. The society piece, let's set this aside. Let's just, just, just talk about business and profit and shareholder value. Comment on, on what the repercussions are for this underutilization of resource, underutilization of talent that we have in this industry. Yeah, absolutely. The research shows that organizations have better return on investment when there are women in leadership roles. And there have been many studies that have shown this across the board. And I would be happy to share those later on with specific links, but research shows that organizations not only perform better when there are diverse teams solving their problems and creating their solutions, but they also actually create better solutions. Scott Page did some research where he looked at the problem solving abilities of groups that were homogenous or diverse groups of people. And the diverse groups of people solve problems across the board better and faster than the homogenous groups. So we have two different issues here. One is just, it, it, it's about numbers, right? Talent, if you think talent is, is uh, spread along kind of a norm curve, right? Then by cutting off a whole group of people, by underutilizing that group, you're actually depriving yourself of, uh, of, of access to talent. So there's just a number issue, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You not only have fewer people, but you have fewer ideas and you have fewer different types of solutions that are come, going to come forward. And you're going to solve different problems. When you have different people thinking about what problems need to be solved, you're going to select different problems to solve and you're going to solve all of them differently. It's across the board impacting organizations, innovation, business, tech. And then if we take a look at, at men and women, you know, whether you buy into there's no difference between men and women or that there's a biological difference between men and women or a God-determined difference between men and women or a socialized difference between men and women, it kind of doesn't make, it, make any difference to this point that the difference that people have, as you say, causes them to analyze problems differently and also to interact differently. Could you talk a little bit about how that actually functions in a dynamic, how women might approach the, uh, the solving of problems? Um, and then, you know, this is, a, this is an industry that thrives on design, right? Mm -hmm. Everything about software, everything about hardware is about design. So it's about confronting problems and solving them. How do women solve problems differently than men might? So when you think about women and men, research shows that there are actually more differences among women or among men 
than there are between women and men as large groups. With that said, as you mentioned, there are potentially socialized behaviors and patterns that come about as people develop that may come to bear in a workplace. And we do see that in the workplace, there are differences when you have diverse groups in a meeting, for example. So one example that we like to talk about at NCWIT is that when you bring together a group that is well split between men and women, you actually see that the problem solving ability of that group improves. And that is largely because the behavior of the group improves. When women are at the table, they are more likely to take turns in the conversation. More people around the table are able to speak up. And that is not necessarily because of the behavior of the women, but because of the presence of the women, where it actually brings about a more respectful conversation in that moment. Well, one of the things that I, that I know about myself is that, I, I, I and, and whether it's just in me or I've been socialized in this way, I tend to drive the conversation, right? But when you drive a conversation, you're not stepping back and listening. You're directing which means that you can go past a turnoff pretty quickly and just ignore its, its presence, right? So by okay. giving somebody else room, you can, it, their, their input gets, gets placed in front of you and then you can deal with it. Yes, that's true. And we know that when people are in a situation where they may be feeling like they are um, less invited to speak, and so they're less likely to speak up at a meeting or something like that. It's difficult to get them to bring forward their ideas. And so you can do exactly what you said, which is to invite someone to speak. And as a leader in a room, you have an amazing opportunity to include people that don't naturally contribute. And you also have the opportunity to reach out to people afterwards and say, I noticed you didn't speak up in the meeting. I wanted to find out if you had any ideas that you were hoping to contribute that you didn't have the chance to say as a way to encourage them to bring forth their ideas. I'd like to talk a little bit about the structure of the tech industry, but before we do that, um, let's talk a little bit about what has been in the news with Activision and, and some of the behaviors that we've seen there. We've seen some behaviors, behaviors at Uber that led to the resignation of, of a founder and CEO. Um, if you look at the large tech firms, we, we hear complaints of, of the so-called bro culture. Um, could you just talk a little bit about what has transpired and how consciousness has been raised in the industry over the last months? And in particular, with particular reference to some of these very sensational and, and really troubling uh, behaviors that, that we've seen in, in some of these companies. Yeah, it really is quite troubling <laughs> to hear the stories that we're hearing. Um, certainly these are stories that if you talk to women who have been in tech for many years are not surprising generally to the women that you talk to. Uh, but what may be surprising is that they have become so public. And these types of behaviors are exactly the types of subtle and not so subtle biases that come to play in the workplace. And the aggressions and the microaggressions that underrepresented people and women, in this case, we're talking about in particular, are experiencing in the workplace. And these are the types of things that drive people out of the workplace. As you mentioned earlier, um, many people left from these particular circumstances, but overall, we know that women in tech leave at twice the rate of men. So 56% of women in a mid-level tech role in a corporation will leave by mid-career. And that's double the rate of men. So as an investor, that's that's really troubling because if you have staff churn, you're creating costs that are unnecessary, right? That's right. <laughs> and you're also creating reputational risk. Uh, people who leave and are pissed off, they're not necessarily going to be your great ambassadors for your company. So recruiting becomes more difficult. And then you have the, the whole issue of the product itself. If you have engineers who are leaving, in the middle of projects, you have to replace those engineers, and you and you have you have a you have product uh, uh, products that are delayed. How does that affect shareholder behavior, or has it affected shareholder behavior? Are people just happy if the company is profitable and will tolerate uh, these kinds of uh, behaviors? 
Yeah, we certainly are not seeing a lot of repercussions on organizations other than at an individual level, as you mentioned. Uh, we haven't seen large scale repercussions where groups of people are boycotting companies, for example. We haven't really seen that. Um, but one of the other things that we do see, as you mentioned, all those things that affect a company from an investor viewpoint. But the other problem is that we will never solve this problem if we don't solve corporate culture. Many, many organizations and corporations try really hard to talk about how can we recruit more women? How do we get more girls interested in computing earlier? Great, let's do that. But if half of them leave every single year, you're not solving the problem. So you, yes, you have to get more interested in the beginning, but you also have to solve the retention problem because it will just continue to perpetuate. Do we also have a structural issue, um, an impediment to change? Um, if you take a look at, you, you had made the previous decision that a lot of the deciders are men. So on the business to business side, the purchasers are very often, if they're in tech, they're going to be preponderantly men, right? Dealing with preponderantly male uh, teams on the uh, software side uh, when they're when they're making um, uh, purchasing decisions, is this an, an issue where uh, we really need to all take a step back and sort of look at this notion of optimizing corporate performance and think to ourselves, well, wait a second, maybe we have been, we have all been behaving in ways that have been suboptimal, but because it's the norm, we don't even think about it. How do, we, how do we create that consciousness? Does your organization provide data to allow people like me, a man, someone who has been in tech, to shift my behaviors, even if I think that they're, they're just normal behaviors? Yes. And I'm so glad you asked that question, because what you're getting at is the root of how we make change. So at NCWIT, we work on systemic change. And we work exactly like you're talking about with organizations to change the culture of the organization. Because these biases that we have about women in tech, and we all have them, um, these biases we have about women in tech, they manifest in our policies, our procedures, our processes at our workplace. They manifest in small and large ways in the workplace. And what NCWIT does is we work with organizations to help them find these biases and change the ways they do business to mitigate these biases. For example, you need to look at the way you write your job descriptions because job description wording actually impacts who applies for your job. You need to look at how you do interviews because that affects who is going to accept a job if you make an offer. You need to look at how you do performance reviews, how you do task assignment. All of these things are places where the bias can lurk. And so you need to look at the the specifics of your organization and how you do things. And that's exactly what NCWIT does. One of the things that, that is so interesting about this sort of notion of unconscious, unintended bias is how do you end up with a discussion that leads to action as opposed to this uh, hand wringing that uh, where where everybody's afraid to do anything because they're going to be accused of, of bias. How do you create a safe space for change and a safe space for advocacy mm -hmm. right? so that the advocate has room to speak, right? But the person who is unintentionally biased, somebody like me, um, does not feel attacked. Mm -hmm. By advocates, right? Because we're in this country, we're we're kind of like this. How do we how do we redirect the energy into into a more productive uh, approach? Absolutely. One of the things we like to say at NCWIT is that women are not broken, men are not the enemy, culture is the enemy. We're all in this together. This is not about someone with a bias being a bad person. It's not about someone who is afraid to speak up being a bad person. This is about all of us working together to find the, the policy and procedural places in our organizations where we can make change and to normalize these conversations. One of the things that is really impactful in an organization is to normalize the conversation so it isn't so scary. 
one of the things that we do with many of the companies we work with is we talk to them about how you do this normalization. Some companies do things where they have a section on their biweekly or monthly staff meeting that's this month in bias. Did anyone see anything this month that was potentially a biased statement or a biased behavior? What did you do? How would you deal with that in the future? And making this something that we all feel comfortable talking about and helping people come up with strategies about how you deal with it when you see it. When you see a bias, what do you do? And that really brings the temperature down of the conversation and helps us all see that we're on the same team. We're all trying to solve the same problem. And we're all trying to make our cultures better for everyone. You don't make the culture better for one group. You make the culture better for the entire organization. You know, it's so interesting because what you what you seem to be doing here in this approach is looking at the, the company that is designing the software or designing the hardware or designing whatever technology it is. You're, you're looking at the design of the company as being part of the product design. Right. So just as you are solving a product design problem, you're basically extending that notion to the company being part of the product design problem. Right. Absolutely. You optimally leverage your 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 talent and you remove barriers to that idea of problem solving through repairing the culture and creating voice and creating opportunity and creating um, this sort of an inclusive idea so that all the engineers can actually make their best contribution. That's exactly right. Uh, you said that in such a lovely way. That's exactly right. We just took two polls. Um, there is a huge consensus, uh, certainly um, among these attendees, that um, that leveling the playing field for women in tech uh, is very important. We also asked, what is the biggest barrier to women in tech? And we asked people to just choose um, we had um, um, about a third of the people um, uh, said that there was a lack of professional mentorship and there's also gender bias. We've spent a lot of time talking about gender bias. I'd like to talk about uh, the mentorship issue. Uh, but there's also the issue of sort of societal bias. Let's talk a little bit about uh, mentoring. And then let's go back to our discussion of sort of the structure of these companies. So you've got the boards, you've got the executive management staff, the middle management staff, and all the worker bees. Let's talk a little bit about mentoring. Do you find that there are mentors um, on boards and on executive teams that encourage um, the hiring of, uh, of women or is, it, are, are the, is the mentoring running along different lines where that topic is not really discussed? Yeah, <laughs> I think that there are so many different answers to that question and so many different ways to look at it. One of the things that I want to mention about mentorship that is important is drawing a distinction between mentorship and sponsorship. Because we talk a lot about mentorship and how if women had more mentors, they would make it farther in organizations. And while that may be true, it's also true that sponsorship sometimes is more powerful. So sponsorship and mentorship are cousins, but they're not exactly the same. You know, mentorship is sort of this relationship where it's a general offering of advice and such. Okay. And then, yeah. And then sponsorship is much more specific where a senior level person really puts their neck out to get a more junior level person advanced within the organization and is very specific about advancing that person's career in a much more structural way. And we want to see that women and other underrepresented people are getting sponsored and not just mentored. It's a very important part of the dynamic. And the other piece is making sure that we don't always tap the senior women to mentor the junior women. We need men to mentor women. We need women to mentor men. It needs to be a much more equivalent <laughs> type of process where it's not just, okay, you're a senior woman, now go mentor these five junior women. That's not going to get us there. Um, it, it's interesting. Um, uh, one of our attendees said we were, that she was looking for uh, sponsorship, the sponsorship option in the, in the poll. It's such an important point. It's something that I've overlooked, right? I've, I've equated mentorship and sponsorship, but it's absolutely uh, true that when you're putting yourself on a line as a senior person, um, it 
it's far easier to sponsor somebody who looks like you. Yes. And if we have an issue of inclusiveness based in race or, or based in gender or based in orientation, and the people who are making the decisions look differently than those who are up and coming, you have a structural impediment. Uh, do you provide um, counseling um, and do your members provide counseling internally to companies that would like to uh, take advantage of all this talent, mm -hmm. but, but have perhaps embedded unconscious biases um, that are, um, that make sponsorship more difficult to achieve? Yes, we have more than 200 resources that we have created and our research team has created that help companies and individuals in this exact way. We have a resource specifically about sponsorship and mentorship and how to develop a sponsorship program and mentorship program within your company and how to bring out the the most powerful aspects of these different types of relationships. So we certainly do have resources that help companies with this. Um, we're launching a poll right now. It'll be very interesting to uh, to see. I'm just I'm just referencing because it would be great to have everybody uh, respond. It's about um, how uh, tech companies can engage more women in tech, and we have a, a mix of different answers. We'll get back to that in a bit. But we were talking about uh, sponsorship at, at particularly at the board and executive levels. Can we talk a little bit about the pipeline of of, of uh, women talent? and whether that pipeline is also satisfactory, uh, because there can be educational impediments or other uh, career entry impediments uh, to women. Could you just describe uh, how you see that particular part of the landscape? Yeah, so it is certainly true that we have to attack the entire ecosystem at once to make a difference here. And so we do that at NCWIT through both the corporate culture pieces that I've been talking about, but also through pipeline programs. Uh, we work with universities, we work with K-12 organizations on their own internal cultures. How do you introduce computing in an engaging way to all types of students? Um, we do offer professional training to school counselors to help them understand how you look at computing as a potential field help them understand what types of students might be interested in computing because they have bias too. And they're not necessarily trained in what it means to have a computing career and what types of career options are out there. There are so many different types of computing careers. And if you're a school counselor and you're not familiar with the hundreds of career options out there for someone in computing, you might not be able to counsel about that. So it's absolutely important to work across the board, starting when students are quite young about introducing mathematical concepts, computing concepts, computational thinking. We have resources about computational thinking skills that don't even involve computers. So how do you help students develop those skills early on? Really important work. And I wonder whether the, um, the advent of Zoom and this type of communication online education might actually be helpful because it's also true that uh, certain industries concentrate physically in certain areas of the country, but if we can provide education and connection and counseling and, um, and all those different services through this type of interaction, maybe there's a way that we can uh, improve our structural outreach electronically to those with access, but we still have the issue of certain areas not having access to, uh, to, to broadband uh, certain um, people based in wealth not having access to this type of equipment so that they can communicate. How do we deal with that with that issue? Yeah, it's a quite complicated set of issues. It is true that having more communication like this and more opportunities like this where people are able to receive information wherever they are does allow those with access to be able to access information they may not have had before. We see this in our counselors program that I was mentioning before, Counselors for Computing, where we are able to reach counselors in rural locations that we had not been able to reach before. Those counselors, because they are in the communities, are able to, in some ways, bridge that gap for people who may not have access to broadband because they are physically there. So that's helpful. But getting broadband access to every student 
is an incredibly important part and becoming more and more important all the time as we rely more heavily on bandwidth intensive activities like this. So the entire tech industry actually has a real interest in solving these problems because if the, if the industry is going to thrive in an increasingly competitive environment, that difference between a company who takes advantage of all the talent and that company that takes advantage of only some of the talent, um, that difference can be the difference between survival and being dominant in their sector, right? Yes, absolutely. So we just asked this really interesting question. We said, how can tech companies engage more women in tech? And we said that people could select up to three elements. The thing that we did here purposefully is we included an array of voluntary and um, coercive elements. And we wanted to see how people would respond. So one of the things that we said is enforce pay equity standards, enforce, right? Meaning that you look at your, your pay and you enforce them, right? Um, we, we talked about mentoring women, which is more voluntary, but then we said hire as many women as men, right? Again, very much of a, a, a more uh, sort of coercive approach. And what was interesting is that, is that we don't really see um, uh, any shying away from the more coercive elements here. Um, if I was running a company that, that had massive numbers of tech workers, um, how do you see this? Is this the kind of thing where um, cajoling, mentoring, educating, and so on um, is the way to go? Or can we also leaven that side of it with more standards-based, basically saying, hey, 50% of our employees should be women or close to it, you know, within that. And if we have only 34%, we got to fix that. Now, um, how do you see that? Yeah, so if you were running a company and you were asking for my advice. <laughs> yes. Okay, let's, let's pretend. Let's play pretend. I, yeah. uh, Mark Zuckerberg has stepped aside. I've gotten the call. Today I'm running Facebook. No, I'm, I'm really curious. How, uh, how, how do I respond? I would tell you that what you need to do today is you need to do systemic change to your culture because the numbers are an outcome. The numbers are not the first place to look. So putting a stake in the ground that said, I'm going to hire 50% of my engineers I hire right now are going to be women is not going to get you where you want to be if you don't fix your culture. And if you don't create a place that is an inclusive place for them. Because so women will I, resign, right? I mean, that was your earlier point. Women, women will keep resigning. So I'll hire 50%, but attrition among women will be higher, which, which, you, pointed, right. which you pointed out previously. So I've still got the same issue. Exactly. How exactly. do I fix it? I'm, I'm Mark Zuckerberg. Well, I'm Mark Oppenheim, but I'm yes. Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> I'm running Facebook now. How do I, how do I deal with this, Terry? Yeah, so NCWIT has a change model that we use, and we have tools that guide you through this process. We have a software platform that we deploy with companies, and we're working with several companies today on this. That's a team-based tool where we take a tech team and we have them look at their own inclusive culture awareness, their maturity on an inclusive culture scale. And I would have you take your company and put your teams through this process of looking at themselves, looking at their own cultures, and then systematically making changes, making sure that they're doing the things that they need to do to have an inclusive culture. And I would, inc I would enforce <laughs> things like when you are hiring an engineer, your final slate of hirees must be diverse. And it's not one woman on the slate, it's at least two. Because research also shows that if you have a final slate of four individuals and there's one woman and three men, the woman will almost never get hired because people don't hire the one that's different. So I would enforce things like your final slate for every engineer must have two women on it. Are there negative repercussions that I, that I would have to fear, even if they're not, even if my fears aren't valid? Um, are there negative repercussions that I would have to fear from pursuing something like you're describing so aggressively, um, could I, would I have to fear that, that men would leave, you know, key, key uh, males who are occupying positions would become alienated and just leave the company? 
Um, would I have to fear that somehow we get diverted from a focus on whatever service we provide? Um, and we're, we're trying to do social engineering. Um, would I, would, could there be negative cultural repercussions from this kind of thing, resentments that build up um, mm -hmm. and explode into view? I mean, there certainly could be. The first step in any endeavor like this is to get buy-in from the leaders of the team on which you're doing this work. And so having the team understand and the leadership understand why this work is happening and the outcomes of this work, what are we going to get to is absolutely the first step. And if you don't take that first step of getting buy-in from your leaders, then you are likely to have negative repercussions and pushback and things happen. But if people understand what they're doing, why they're doing it, and where we're going to go, and people are in agreement, then people will see that this is going to benefit everybody. So the first step is not to be an autocrat. The first step is to actually talk about things. Absolutely. Absolutely. Terry Hogan, uh, President and CTO of the National Center for Women and in Information Technology. This has been such a fascinating discussion. So content rich. Thank you so much. Uh, let's share some of those links. Um, if you could send them to us, we'll, we'll get them uh, uh, distributed. And, uh, and thanks so much. Thanks to attendees for helping us with uh, your responses to the polls and, uh, and your questions. And have a great day. Everybody mask up.